All right, this is uh, for my second hour class on the 28th of uh, April. Okay. Well, um, you know, Andrew Johnson, you know, first of all, there are four major plans of reconstruction. I'm sure there were more, but there are four major plans. First of all, Lincoln, even before the Civil War, puts his 10% is over, puts his 10% plan into effect. He wants to make the war. Do you have any paper? Yes. Well, just borrow some. Can you just, you know, good gosh, you know, if you confront a small problem, do something about it. I don't, I don't think there's a paper shortage in this country yet. Anyway, yeah, there's a couple of pieces there, and you'll be in good shape. Okay, anyway, Lincoln came up with a 10% plan. It was pretty mild and pretty easy. If 10% of the people, I mean, essentially it said if 10% of the people um, swore that they were loyal, that had voted, just 10% that had voted in the election of 1860, not the whole population of the state, but just 10% that raised their hand and said we're loyal to the Union, they could come back in. And, and he put his plan in effect before the war was even over. He, he had readmitted three states. Three states were back in the Union on the day that Lee surrendered to Grant. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Lincoln was assassinated and, and the rest of his plan went to the grave with him because when the war is finally over, the Republicans believed that the South had committed treason, which they had, and they had to be punished for that. Now, the degree of punishment differed among different Republicans, but the Republicans believed that a couple of things had to happen. Number one, the, uh, uh, the South had to be punished for treason. They had to write new constitutions. Uh, they had to accept the 13th Amendment. They had to renounce secession. And in the Wade Davis bill, and I've got, here's Henry Wade and Benjamin Davis. There's the two guys. The Wade Davis bill said that, uh, you know, they had to take an ironclad oath, uh, which essentially said we never supported the Confederacy in any, in any way. Well, how many Southerners could say that? Well, not very many. Uh, and so uh, Johnson, Andrew Johnson, who did not believe the war had been fought over slavery, uh, he thought it had been fought to save the Union. He said, what's this got to do with slavery? Why do people have to take an oath? You know, why, the, the, or why do states have to say they support the 13th Amendment? That's not the, what the war was about. So he vetoed the bill, and that bill died. And then Andrew Johnson became, or jo Johnson came up with his own Reconstruction plan, and he said, well, you know, I, 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 I'm like Lincoln. I want to make it as short and painless as possible. The war was fought to save the Union. Let's get the Union back together and go on about our our business. Uh, and, uh, he, you know, there he was alone. The Congress wasn't in session, and he comes up with this plan in the summer of 1865 and essentially readmits the South. I mean, he, he tries to elevate poor whites and middle-class Southerners, and they won't have anything to do with it because they view him as a traitor. And by the way, the lost cause uh, mythology was beginning, and, you know, Lee and Davis and Stonewall Jackson and all of these people were rising to the heights of demagogue, demagogues, not gogs, but demagogues in the South. And people tended to, your, your ordinary Southerner tended to view um, uh, Andrew Johnson as some sort of traitor. And so, when, you know, he allowed them to elect their officials. And uh, when they did, they elected the same old people. And at that point, Johnson said, to heck with it. I tried to, you know, give you people political power. You won't take it. He said the Reconstruction's over. Uh, and then, of course, in uh, December of 1865, uh, the Congress comes back. He, they hadn't even been, Johnson had not even consulted them about the Reconstruction. And the Congress comes back and milling around in, in the United States ca Capitol are former cabinet members in Jefferson Davis's cabinet, former senators from uh, the Confederate Congress, former generals, you know, all these Confederate officials, they've been elected by the people back home and they're waiting to be sworn into the House and the uh, Senate. And, of, you know, I mean, it's just as this what the South was saying, you know, we're going to pick up right where we left off. We, we didn't lose this war. We weren't even defeated. It's very defined. It's a kind of in your face. You may think you defeated us, but here we are back again. And we want to be part of this government that just eight months ago we were trying to destroy. Well, of course, as I said to you yesterday, the Constitution has a little clause in it, the 14th Amendment, that says anybody that participated in the overthrow or an attempt to overthrow the government is ineligible to serve in that government. And so they throw all these guys out. You know, we're kind of dusting off the 14th Amendment today because there are some senators, a couple of them, and a few representatives 
who are accused, and I say this, they are accused. There has been no trial. Nobody has been found guilty of anything, but they are accused of uh, participating or at least lending their support as officials of the United States government to this January 6th insurrection. And the Democrats are spearheading this. Uh, and the Democrats are saying that if those people attempted to overturn an election, that according to the 14th Amendment, they are no longer eligible to run uh, for office. In fact, uh, they are calling uh, before this committee right now, as I'm speaking to you, they're calling before this committee former members of the Trump administration, and they are seeking the power to call <coughs> former President Trump before the committee to try and ascertain if he in any way encouraged the assault on the Capitol on January the 6th. And if he did, uh, the Democrats are saying, and so a few Republicans, a few Republicans, Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, who I think are the future hope of the as a Republican, I think they're the future hope of the party. That's my opinion. But uh, they are saying, if we can prove that Donald Trump in any way encouraged this, and I, uh, uh, he would not be eligible to run for president of the United States in 2024. And here's another one of my opinions. I believe if he wants to run for president, if they don't get him on that, and I don't think they will, but if they don't, if they don't, I think if he wants to run for president in 2024, uh, there is no Republican that can defeat him for the nomination. And if he gets the nomination, I think he will be elected. I don't like that one little bit. Uh, but uh, I happen to live in a state and in an entire section of the country that just loves that. There's nothing they would like better than to see Donald Trump back in the White House. I'm starting to keep a little journal of how many flags I see flying around this county that say, don't blame me, I voted for Trump. Now, there are some others, too, that say things about Biden. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, I don't maybe count those, too. But, no, I know I'm in, an, uh, I'm in a vast, vast, vast minority of people, and all I can say is, Proudly so, proudly so. But if you like Trump, uh, if they don't get him on this 14th Amendment thing, and I don't think he will, then you ought to be just jumping with joy because he's probably going to be your next president. Uh, so I don't like that, but uh, guess what? This country isn't governed by what I like or dislike. Anyway, uh, we're dusting off the 14th Amendment again. See, that's a little not when you do that eighth grade worksheet history where the 14th Amendment granted citizenship to African Americans. Now let's go on. But there's a lot more to the 14th Amendment to, than that. Uh, it's the greatest civil rights amendment in the Constitution. The 14th, we ought to read the whole thing anyway. So then, January of 1865, get this down, they sent these newly elected Republican, I mean, excuse me, Democrat senators and the Republicans sent these newly uh, elected uh, uh, Democrat senators and members of the House of Representatives home. And then they get this down. They, if you don't have it now, then they scrapped the presidential reconstruction. So that went up to the ash heap of history, along with the 10 percent plan, the Wade Davis bill presidential reconstruction is gone. And I think this is exactly where we stopped yesterday. Then the Congress said, we're going to run this reconstruction. And they formed the joint committee. That means they had senators and representatives on it, all Republicans. And well, there might've been a sprinkling of Democrats. <laughs> Didn't want to be that unfair. Well, they wanted to, but I guess they thought this won't look good. So we need to drag along a couple of Democrats wagging their crippled tails. And they formed the Joint Committee on Reconstruction, and they and literally got this down. They took the power away uh, from the executive branch to run Reconstruction. They said the Congress is going to do it. In fact, their purpose in all of this is to make Andrew Johnson look inconsequential in the whole matter. He doesn't matter. And the radicals were led by, here's the main leader, uh, Thad Stevens. We talked about him yesterday, right? The bald-headed clubfoot guy, the hair wig episode, yeah. His black mistress, which was shocking in those days, you know. Uh, Benjamin F. Butler, there's another one. Looks very happy. All these guys look so happy. You know, that's, that's what they're about. And by the way, they're all liberals. There's not a liberal Republican alive. I'm not. A, I'm a Republican, but I'm not a liberal. But you, you listen. You can search high and low, and there ain't no liberal Republicans left. 
And that may be, that right there may be the death knell of the Republican Party. You need, you know, to keep things vibrant. This whole country is based on differences of opinion. You know, uh, and a, politi a, a healthy political party that says 100 years from now we're going to be here has to be a party of different voices. It can't all be one way. It can't be the party of Trump or anybody else. But right now, it's the party of Trump. That's what the Republican Party is. And if you don't believe that, uh, well, it may have already happened. They may have already had the state Republican convention. You know, just uh, just go over there and wear a uh, with a big button and wear a um, oh, I don't know, uh, <clears throat> Chris Christie for president. But uh, they would throw you out in the parking lot. Anyway, there's. Benjamin F. Butler. And then, of course, there's Henry Wade and Benjamin Davis. When I talk about the leaders of this movement, there they are. And get this down. The first thing they did once they scrapped presidential reconstruction is they passed the Civil Rights Bill of 1866. That's the first civil rights bill in American history. The Civil Rights Bill of 1866. This is before the 14th Amendment. This is before the 15th Amendment. It isn't an amendment, but it's the Civil Rights Bill of 1866. And I want you to know what it said. And these are Republicans doing this, by the way. Uh, it granted citizenship to all persons born in the United States. So if you're born here, you're a citizen. That's it. No test. If you're born here, you're a citizen. Including freedmen. And you are equal before the law. And they sent that to the president. And what did the president immediately do? Veto. Vetoed it, got that down. And the Congress overrode the veto, and the Civil Rights Bill became law. However, get this down. After they passed this, and I'm doing this so quickly, people say, yeah, it's, this is monumental. This is one of the most important moments in American history. But once they got it, once they overrode the president's veto, then a problem arose. They said, look, yeah, we passed this bill, but somebody in Georgia or Ohio or Maine might contest that. Somebody that said, wait a minute, anybody born in this country is a citizen? We don't want Native Americans to be citizens, for God's sake. What if they ever get the right to vote? <clears throat> we don't want those wild Irish people. You know, what if... The what if somebody challenges it? What if somebody in Georgia said, we don't want black people as citizens? Are you nuts? There are four million of them. Combine all these groups and they'll overrun the country and it'll be the end of America. It's the same argument that people use on immigration today. If we don't build a wall, all these strange people are going to come in here and the next thing you know, we're going to be the 29th state of Mexico where the United States will cease to exist. Woe is us. It was the same concern they had. So what if somebody takes this to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court rules like they did, in which case we talked about that a black person can never be a citizen? What? I can't hear you. It's all right. Speak loud. Even if you're wrong, it won't hurt you. No, no. Roe v. Wade is not until 1973. and That's abortion. But anyway. What? Dred Scott. Excellent. Advance to the head of the class. Stay where you are. You're already there. Yeah, you're right. In, in 1856, 57, right? Just 20 years before this, the court had essentially said that, that a black person could never be, and, a, and they had, and, and a black person had no rights to a white man. The, the, in other words, this is a law, and laws can be overturned. <coughs> and so, so can Supreme Court cases. Speaking of Roe v. Wade, you may see that this summer. They can. The court can go back and overturn a case. And they've got a conservative majority, and they might do that. And what's the appeal to that? Can you appeal a decision of the same Supreme Court? Who can, who, can, who, can, who can reverse a decision of the Supreme Court? You can? Yeah. No, you can't. Only the Supreme Court can. That's why they call it the Supreme Court, not the county court or the sort of supreme or the pretty high big powerful court no it's supreme anyway so they said this could be overturned 
And so get this down. The radical said, we're going to make black citizenship a permanent part of the Constitution. And they proposed which amendment? The what? 14th. 14th Amendment. This is where the 14th, the 14th Amendment came out of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And by the way, they were quite certain that this would pass. What is it? How many states have to approve uh, an amendment? Not two-thirds. It's a steeper hill than that. Listen, when they wrote this Constitution, they said you can change it, but it's really hard. What? What? Three-fourths. That's exactly right. Why were they so certain that three-fourths of the states would pass it? Because the southern states weren't back in the Union. And they were right. Get this down. It passed. It wasn't difficult. But again, who's standing in the way of the radical Republicans and all they want to do? Andrew Johnson. He had finally reluctantly, and I mean reluctantly, he is just getting around to accepting the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery. He was debating that in his mind. Really? Should we do away with slavery? I mean, really? Is, is it that bad? But he was absolutely opposed to the 14th Amendment, the 14th, which says, by the way, all persons born in the United States. This big issue down on the border. A Mexican woman will become pregnant, or maybe a Nicaraguan or a Honduran woman that has made her way up to, and she will come into the United States and have that baby. And that baby, according to the 14th Amendment, is the citizen of the United States. And right now in the Congress, there are several right-wing Republicans who want to change the 14th Amendment. God save the Republic, but they want to change the 14th Amendment. For most of our history, do you think all the Irish people that came here took the citizenship test? No. And not just them, Italians and Poles and Germans, and you just go down the list of 19th century immigration. They just came here. And if you, if you managed to get here, you were an American. Get a job, go to work, we don't care. What? I can't understand you. Learn English. That was about, that was about it. Until now, in the 21st century. By the way, there's a big issue. There are people called dreamers. Their parents came here illegally 20 years ago, and they, have, they were born here, but they never applied for citizenship. There are people right here in this town, I know that way. They're productive citizens. They're hardworking citizens. They pay, you, know, you, know, you know what, how much, you know what, how many dollars in taxes that the, the illegal uh, aliens, we call them, undocumented immigrants, we want them rounded up. You know what they pay in Oklahoma, this little old state with 4 million people? You know how much taxes they pay every year? Billion dollars a year. What if you took a billion dollars next year out of the Oklahoma budget? How would we be doing? No, probably not good. They're law-abiding. One of the big myths about it is that let those immigrants in, boy, those you know, crime rates go up through the sky. Well, guess what? Uh, Oklahoma City has had a something like a 60% increase in the number of immigrants living in Oklahoma City, most of them Hispanic. And you know what's happened to the murder rate in Oklahoma City? It's dropped 45%. That doesn't sound like a crime wave to me. And all this hoo-ha about, well, they're bringing fentanyl across the border. And some people are. By the way, the main entry port, just, just, I don't care what you think, you know, you can disagree with me a hundred and thousand and ten percent. I don't care. But just for the record, you ought to disagree with me on the fact that here's the fact, you know, where most illegal drugs into this country from? Not across, from, from your desk? Oh my God. <laughs> call ICE, call them. No. From, they don't, it's not the Mexican border. It's coming through ports like New Orleans and Los Angeles. And that's where most of it comes through. You know why? Because the drug dealers know we're watching the border. Some come through, but why, why do we have a drug problem in this country? You, 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 we're, we're the richest. You, see, you ever think about that? We're the richest and the most powerful nation on earth. Which nation has the power to force us to take drugs? I've never been driving home 
in this little town where everywhere I look, I see one or two, one of two things, an American flag flying or a church steeple. And I'm quite certain in this little old slice of Americana, if I wanted to, Miss McCowan, that I could leave here at 3.30 today and by 4 o'clock I could have any drug they're selling on the streets of Chicago. Bought right here in good old Eufaula. And I'm not picking on good old Eufaula. Pick any little town in the... Why do we have that drug problem? Well, we want drugs. And by the way, we use more illegal drugs than any country on earth. We want them. I've never seen, you know, maybe you have, but I've never seen some fair-haired American boy on his knees with the two Mexican drug dealers with a gun to each head and one in front of him with a joint of marijuana laced with fentanyl saying, smoke it, damn it, smoke it. No, 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 I don't want to. We don't smoke it. You know, no. They're rotting their teeth out and killing themselves on their own volition. I had a guy working on my house one time, and he told me, he said, yeah, my dad's, and he was in his 40s, he said, yeah, my dad's hooked on Oxycontin. <laughs> and he said, and, and, and wait, he said he got it from the, somebody in the VA, had a, had a bad knee, and, so, and he said, and he just said, he took him away, he said, boy, he said, I hope I get addicted on these things. And he is. The old grandpa's just sucking it down, killing himself. Nobody's making him do that. You know what drug? You know what the drug scourge in America is? We we're so, oh, this is being done. No, it's not. It's not being done to us. It's a self-inflicted wound. Let me tell you what'll end the drug war. Oh, what'll end drugs when we don't want drugs anymore? That's it. And all this crap that people. Well, we're going to build a wall and that'll end the drug problem. I guarantee, you, if they build a wall and stop drugs coming from Mexico, we'll be tunneling in and going to Mexico to get it and bring it back. Yeah, that's why. Let's, let's look in the mirror and tell the truth. Let's face up to what we are. Now, that's not all of us, but that's a good... By the way, I don't want to make fun of this. You know, there, when this lecture started, there are seven Americans that are alive, and they'll be dead by the time the next bell rings. You know what's going to kill them? Oxycontin. Yep, seven an hour. That's what it to cost. Anybody making them do that? Anybody? No, they're doing it on their own. That's why we have a drug problem. And uh, when we no longer when we no longer want them, the drug problem will go away. Sad thing about it, we've been fighting the war against drug for fifty years and spent trillions of dollars. I mean, no, no, we we might have paid your college too. I, I would rather pay your college your whole way. Forget your meal plan, your dorm, your parking space out. I'd rather pay that. I'd rather use if we're going to spend trillions of dollars, spend it on that than the drug war that's failed. I regret to. I wish I could say, "Oh, it's succeeded wonderfully," We're, but it hasn't. Yes. Didn't we have uh, like legal drugs at first? Like uh, crack cocaine was used on like teeth and stuff. Like oh that. well, yeah. Uh, heroin didn't become illegal until 1985. If a baby had colic, you know what colic is? Well, an upset stomach. When you were a baby, don't you remember that? When you were a baby, you had it. You were puking all over everything, and your mother was getting tired of you know. Oh, what a pep. And, you know, puking down her back. You're just a puke machine. So she took you to the doctor and he gave you heroin. Suddenly, <laughs> settle your little stomach down. <laughs> That's true. You're right. Yeah. And, and quite frankly, I've never used heroin. I've never used cocaine. I have no desire to. Um, but I hate needles. You know, I hate to have a blood test. You know, if, if you ever go to a clinic where I've been, don't mention my name because they'll throw you out because I'm the worst old, I'm horrible. I know I am. I know I am while I'm doing it. But I just, when they come with me with a needle, I'm just saying, get away from me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and especially taking a shot in the, yeah. I would just assume them rub some cocaine there. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> And the whole side of my head go numb and pull the tooth. Now, I wouldn't want them to let me drive. I think they ought to have to add a little waiting room to the, uh, like when you give blood, you know, a little, little, little detox room over there where I could lay there, you know. And if I wanted to think I was the king of Bulgaria for a couple of hours or Napoleon or something, I could. And just, and then when they said, I came back and they said, Do you still think you're Napoleon? No, I'm not, I don't. I'm Winston Churchill, then they can let me go <laughs> <laughs> and drive. I'm not kidding about that. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't mind that. I hate needles. <laughs> and I, I don't have that many, I, I don't have had tooth 
Well, but I've had a little dental work. <coughs> I've got pretty good teeth. I don't have, it's not like I would be back once a, every other day saying, hey, you better check that back one, you know, to get some more cocaine. I don't think it would come out that way, but I wouldn't. And that's what they used to do. FDR had sinuses, really bad sinuses. And when he spoke with those sinuses, he said, you're probably Daffy Duck. You remember that? Porky Pig. That, 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 that. That's what he sounded like. And so if he had an important radio, his doctor would swab his nostrils with cocaine. And it would just open right up. And then it was the FDR on the radio. You know, it didn't happen very often. And it wasn't like, you know, uh, he woke up the next day and said, we bombed who? Uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like that. But yeah, cocaine doctors carried that forever. <coughs> Marijuana didn't become illegal until 1937. You know, we outlawed booze in 1919 and we made it legal again in 1933. And four years later, I guess to feel a little better about ourselves, we said, well, no more marijuana. And it, it had been legal for 20,000 years. Uh, and I think it'll be legal again. I've never used it. I don't intend to use it. Uh, but I'll say one thing. A lot of times people say, well, you know, if they legalize there are no, uh, there are no uh, uh, debilitating effects. You can smoke marijuana like a chimney, and it'll and yes, it will affect you. Anything that alters your perception, it affects your body. An aspirin does that. When you take an aspirin, that affects your body. Um, and marijuana does too. No sane person uh, who would, uh, no woman who's pregnant would ever smoke, uh, would ever drink, or would ever smoke marijuana. Marijuana uh, decreases the birth weight of babies, and that makes it a pregnancy, which is a, a delivery, I should say, which is already one of the most precarious, dangerous, you know, we just think, oh, you know, they have the baby. Dangerous procedures in the world. You look at the, here we are, the richest and most powerful, nation, the highest standard of living in the world. Look at our infant mortality rate. We're right up there with Bulgaria. It's dangerous. And if you smoke marijuana or you drink alcohol or you smoke cigarettes, you're just adding to your chances to lose your baby or your own life. I think it would be shocking to look up and see how many mothers die in childbirth. We, you know, we think all oh, this, all that you see, they, they have it on television. Oh, everybody's smiling and laughing and joking. No, it's not that way. Uh, so don't think that you can smoke marijuana until your brain is the size of a raisin and it's not going to have any effect on you. It does. And I'll tell you what I think the biggest uh, detriment of it is, is it takes away ambition. It takes away ambition. You don't care. And alcohol does the same thing. That's another, that's another drug that we've, uh, um, you know, if you've got your final coming up on Friday and you said, well, I'm going to go to that study group and you, you know, you start, I'm just going to have a couple of beers and you end up drinking a case of beer. You're probably not going to end up at the study group and you're probably going to fail. You know, uh, right now at the University of Oklahoma, they're not admitting anybody else. The people they're admitting now, they're saying you can start in January. That's how many people they've admitted over there, which I'm happy about that. People want to go to OU. But I want to tell you what, go to their, you know, there'll probably be six or 7,000 of them admitted to you. But you go to the graduation four or five years from now, and it'll be about uh, two thirds of those. And there are always extenuating circumstances. Tear up some bad things happen and people have to drop out and come back later or never come back, just pursue a different. But the majority of them who aren't there to get that diploma, uh, they're not there for a couple of reasons. Like, uh, here are the main reasons. Uh, they couldn't get out of bed in the morning. They missed classes. And they didn't do what they were supposed to do. They drank that half a case of beer instead of going to the study group. And guess what? They've plowed all that money, two or three years worth of money, and they have no degree to show for it. That's why most of them. And I'm sure if you got them all together and one by one said, let's go over and sit in the football stadium, and I want you to come up one by one and tell me why you didn't finish your degree, you would hear sad stories as long as your grandma's nightgown. But in reality, you could say when they were done, well, that's really interesting. But you know why you didn't get your degree? And just hold up a mirror and let them look. It's them in most cases in most cases. So, uh, yeah, you know, don't think you can, you, beer, whiskey, uh, scotch, uh, you know, those are the drugs I use. I, uh, and if you never take a drink, you haven't missed, you haven't missed a thing. You haven't missed a thing. People call that a rite of passage. Well, what do you do? 
I finally got enough sense. Uh, I lived through my rite of passage. It's a miracle that I did, but I finally got enough sense to, uh, you know, I drink scotch now occasionally because I like it. I like the taste of it. I was just drinking it because, well, you know, hell, I'm 18. I'm supposed to drink. And people would drink and go, oh, you know, boy, this is really fun. Ooh, I got to go puke. Oh, this is great. I just like, yeah, yeah. You're going through that age right now. You're not doing anything that teenagers since Pompeii have done before you. You're not breaking any new ground. There's nothing you're doing. <clears throat> but, yeah, don't think you can ingest it to thin your blood in the morning. Take an aspirin. It affects you. It's a drug. That's why they call it a drug. So uh, all of that. Well, anyway, um, how I got on that, I don't know. But uh, anyway, I was talking about the crime rate because one of the myths of, of immigration is if you let these people in, the crime rate. And it's, uh, they said it about the Irish. They said it about the Italians, the Poles, the Poles, you name it. Well, guess what? Back to the subject here. I enjoyed that. I don't know if you did, but I enjoyed it. <clears throat> but in 1866, when they're talking about making these in one fell swoop, making these, uh, these well, back to these uh, legals, just from, you know, they've lived here all their lives. They know no other country except America, and they're people that want to round them up and throw them out. Here's the big debate. You know, these people didn't have any choice uh, to be born in the United States. They were born here, and the 14th Amendment says all persons born. I mean, I don't know how many committees we got to get together to, you know, what, what were they trying to say? They were trying to say, if you're born here, you're a citizen. And that was in 1866. Not 2016. Didn't the radical left liberal Democrats trying to take over this country by getting all these illegal immigrants in here and they'll vote Democratic? No, this is in 1866. And just think about this. All at once, four million people were going to be citizens. Four million people. And by the way, how are most of those people going to vote when they find because citizenship, how are how, how are all those people going to vote? Republican. There's a political aspect to the 14th. 14th Amendment. Um, people look today and say if we, and, 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 and the whole dreamer issue is these people have lived in America. They were born. This is the only country. No, this is their country. Their parents may be from Nicaragua, but this is their country. It is. It's just as much in their country as it is my country. They have careers. They're going to college. They pay taxes. They're law abiding citizens. And there are people that want to uproot them and send them back. But the defense on that is the 14th Amendment says you can't do it. My point is, I guess this morning, is that we're still struggling with the same issue. <coughs> when the 14th Amendment is passed, though, Johnson vetoed it. And they overrode his veto. And his reasoning, you know, when presidents veto something, they have to send the reason back to the Congress. And his reasoning was this, and I quote, he said, this is a country for white men and by, not white women, white men, and by God, as long as I am president, it shall be a government for white men. Well, uh, oddly enough, get this down, many in the North were against black citizenship and suffrage. Many in the North were against black citizenship and suffrage. And when we return for lecture, I'll take it up there. Did you finish those? I'm not surprised. So test tomorrow.